Today I'm joined by Dr. Martin Shaw. Martin is regarded as one of the most outstanding new teachers of the mythic imagination. Visiting fellow at Schumacher College in the UK, he's also devised and led the oral tradition course at Stanford University in the USA. He's the author of the award-winning branch from the Lightning Trees, Snowy Tower, Scatterlings, Smoke Hole, and other classics. Martin now leads a busting schedule of conferences, gatherings, and wilderness retreats over several continents. One that I want to mention in particular will involve Martin and Paul Kingsnorth at Benbar Prairie in November, which I'm most looking forward to. A few day, a few, um, day tickets remain for that event, but uh, you can still join us for the evening talk on Saturday the 26th of November. And I'll leave a link in the description. So uh, just to begin then, Martin, what first prompted your interest in mythology, storytelling, and so some of those central concerns that we see in your work? Now? Nice to meet you, Mark. I think um, childhood poverty probably got me interested in myth. We didn't have a house with a lot in it, but we had plenty of books. Uh, and I have a mum, mum and a dad to this day who love, they love the richness of language. They understand the centrality of stories in our lives. And I just picked it up because there wasn't a telly with an easy access or there certainly we were, you know, 40 years away from the internet or anything like that. So I grew up, very engaged with the the stories that live in a landscape forest or a map by mountains or by the sea and the stories that lived within books you know uh robin hood king arthur uh mongolian stories all sorts and um i suppose how does your understanding of myth then contrast with some of these cruder notions which we kind of use in our modern parlance of something untrue or uh, at worst or even something like fantasy which you mark a contrast with mm. yes myth generally is meant to mean a, yeah a misnomer or something that isn't the case but to give a couple of quotes from people who at this moment i can't even remember who said what something like uh, Myth is a beautiful lie that tells a deeper truth. Um, myth gives us, you know, it, it, if we're just stuck with the facts of something, we're speaking to the wrong part of our imagination and it becomes very arid, it becomes very dry. Something maybe we'll talk about later is my re-engagement with Christianity after 50 year, a 50 year hiatus. And that was partially because the wrong part of my mind was being punted at by a lot of modern Christianity and the Blakean imaginative weirdness of Christ had got a bit lost on me. I couldn't see it. Uh, so the myths found me, pulled me up by the scruff of my neck. And the reality, of course, is as we get older, when we go through divorces or illness or malaise or disappointment, those stories that we loved as a child, whether it's a Russian fairy tale or an Irish myth, you begin to understand the symbolic frame with which they are radiating wisdom out to you. If you have the ears to behold it, the eyes to behold it. Um, so in my 20s and 30s, through all the ordinary catastrophes everybody goes through, I rediscovered the stories that I loved as a child and I clung to them like a kind of life raft. Mm -hmm. I want to take a, a long quote actually that I've copied just and um, use that to kind of meditate upon. So you, you said what I looked for was some archaic language that would expand words and frame images so beautifully that I felt connected to human folk as well as kestrels and mud. What I found was a myth. Myth is promiscuous, not dogmatic. It moves like a, a lively river through swarthy packs of reindeer, great aristocratic families and the wild gestures of an Iranian carpet seller. Myth is not much to do with the past, but a kind of magical present that can flood our lives with when the conditions are just so. It's not just the neurosis of humans trying to fathom our place on the earth, but something, sometimes the earth actually speaking back to us. That's why some stories can be hard to approach. They're not necessarily formed from a human point of view. I just want to ask you a little bit about that, Martin. Um, can you tell us 
why this magical present is so vital, I suppose, especially now when some of us seek to return to a past that never was, and then others seem to promise a future that never will be, if I might put it that way. Yes, I mean, I am, I am generally in favour of what I would call the luminous present. Uh, and the luminous present has both the past and the future in it. A good present is not this thing out on its own. It has tendrils going both ways. Um, it's funny, you know, when we, we hear of people going to reenactment fairs or having a longing for reading fantasy books and the rest, we can be we can be a, a little dismissive of it but often actually you know do you, i don't know if you were if you're old enough to remember the enormous effect of the lord of ring lord of the rings movies about 15 years ago uh going to the cinema for the first time in years and seeing 200 people in emotional disarray at the end of each of those movies that was not that was not a trite experience. That was actually a move towards soul. It was a move towards deepening because we are story-led creatures. We're image-led creatures. We're mythically-led creatures. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. It's very ancient in us. So there's something essential about myth. Now, in that quote you just gave me, which I've realized actually is from my first book, so some time ago, uh, the really important bit for me in that quote is the notion of stories not constructed entirely from a human point of view. That's, that's the sweet spot in that, because a lot of mythologists who are effectively secular in their thinking and effectively you know, uh, agnostic at best will say, myths derive from human beings looking around at the debris of their own life and figuring out a narrative because it's just so terrifying. Mm -hmm. But if you were to go into an indigenous culture, an Aboriginal culture, they'd say that's not the case at all. That's too anthropocentric. They'd say, no, we just went walkabout and the world started to gossip to us. You know, the trees gossiped, the stars gossiped, the big mountain gossiped, the river gossiped. And somewhere in the conversation between the gossip of the river and the buffalo and me came a story. That's beautiful. That's much more powerful than us trying to kind of crowbar everything into the notion that we're just so neurotic. We have to create stories because we're terrified. The reality is we still live in a miraculous world. We're surrounded by wonder. And the really old stories are extraordinary because they seem to come from a variety of perspectives as you go through it. These days we watch a Hollywood movie and we see who the central character is, we recognize who the hero is, but in old Inuit stories or Aboriginal stories or even Irish stories actually, you the perspective of the story can change. And one moment it seems a raven is telling the tale. Then it's a young girl with a broken heart dressed in a bear skin. Then it's an old king in the middle of the winter. We see it from a variety of angles and that keeps it animate, keeps it alive. It keeps it essential. And most importantly, it keeps us in love with the world. All these old stories are about a love affair that we've rather neglected and forgotten. Mm, amen. Thanks for sharing that, Martin. Um, the philosopher Peter Kraft, I remember, who he mentioned something like that, where uh, we moderns often perceive that we're just projecting even like gender kind of terms onto the universe, whereas traditional societies had the balance of the masculine and the feminine, the yin and the yang, the movement of the sea and the moon and all this, as there were integrated within the cosmos rather than the kind of the the idea that we're strangers to the universe just projecting on as you're kind of suggesting so thanks i think that's the most important point thanks for sharing that martin and um i should say too that something that i really respect and love about your work is how you've put skin in the game as it were you've went out and lived this kind of these beliefs and um incarnate the incarnated these kind of patterns so I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a little bit about your time living in the wilderness. You spent a lot of time in a tent and how that came about and how that's helped to form the man that you are now, I suppose. 
Yes, um, yeah, that's true. I, I did spend four years uh, in a black tent, moving across slowly across the West Country of Britain, living on a succession of hills and copses and valleys. Uh, it felt very important at that time in my life to be unshackled from a lot of what modernity was selling us. And I, I must emphasis, emphasize, as I try to do, but people don't always hear it. You know, I was not a character, you know, like Thoreau. I wasn't utterly divorced from other people. Uh, I was quite happy to go to the pub. I had friends, you know, uh, but no doubt about it, my head was turned in a kind of mystical direction because when I was 23, I'd spent four nights on a hill up in Wales, up in Snowdonia. And the spiritual technology of that experience so rattled me. And I mean, let's face it, it's what all, all Irish saints and holy women have done from the beginning. It's no different. I just went up and sat still till God walloped me with a bit of lightning, really. <laughs> So I came back and decided to change the shape of my life. And that was over 25 years ago, over a quarter of a century ago. And I've just been heading diligently in that direction ever since, trying to find a kind of soulful spiritual sensibility that in my youth, because I grew up in a Christian house, I couldn't quite contact for some reason couldn't quite contact it. So I took myself out into the bush, not really realizing that in doing that, actually I was making a move towards my Celtic forebears, you know, or the Desert Fathers or whatever. I don't put myself in any of that kind of highfalutin bracket, but the aspiration of the heart was similar. Mm. Wonderful. And um, that's something that came across in previous conversations that I listened to with you is, the importance of spending these kind of prolonged time periods out in the wilderness. I wonder if you could speak to that and how does that lend itself to genuine mystical experiences and then how can this help us go beyond the kind of emotivism as it were and um, focusing for longer periods and what kind of in McGilchrist calls this the sacred that so many of us are fascinated by. There's an old aboriginal idea that modern society is three days deep Modern society is three days deep. And actually, your own self-obsession is only about three days deep. If you think that most of us basically worship the cult of ourselves these days and our passions, our needs, me, you know, we gesture to the chest, me, 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 me. After three, three days without food, you have ground through all the issues with your lack of success or your complex relationship with your aunts and your uncles. And it's you out in the burren, in the rain, weeping in a cave. And at that moment, and only really at that moment, something wonderful can happen. Uh, and some spirit can enter. So in the old, yeah, keeping a, a sort of an old phraseology around it, the notion was modernity is three days deep. It's wonderfully good news for us because we're sitting here with our phones and we feel so trapped and it all feels so desperate, it all feels so hopeless. I'm a bearer of relatively good news. You can go cold turkey quite quickly and you can be open to the majesty of an experience just as powerful as something that happened in, you know, AD, uh, you know, 200, 300. It's still all out there. The problem, Mark, the problem with it is when you open up to the profundity of an encounter like that, but you return to a culture that has amnesia or hostility to it. And that's what happened to me. I ended up in South London again, uh, bumping up to a world that really didn't want to hear about it. And any seeds that I was spilling was falling on very fallow ground, which is why I then went, out, went back out into the bush for another four years and have done variants of that for a long time. In other words, um, we know this and we know this, you know, we know this through the Bible, strange, deeply sacred things happen when you leave the domestic. They can happen in the domestic too, but when you do, you know, put down your nets, head out into the bush, looking for what one of your great philosophers, John Moriarty called your bush soul. You look for your bush soul, uh, you know, uh, 
extraordinary things can happen. But just to re-emphasize what I said, it takes some time. I saw a poster recently and it said vision quests for busy people. And it was all meant to be done in an afternoon. You've got to avoid things like that. Uh, I always emphasize, if possible, take the long route in almost everything. Take the long route. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Thanks, Martin. And um, another facet, which I think complements what we're describing and um, contrasts with the kind of modern mentality that you kind of lamented there is your respect for poetry in a kind of broad perspective. I want to ask you a little bit about that. And you've translated a Celtic folklore and poetry and you're, you're featured in Poetry International, the Mystic Review, Poetry Magazine, all these wonderful um, places. And you've contributed different, you've collaborated with Paul Kingsnorth, who we mentioned, Mark Rylance, people like that. I wonder why is poetry and the kind of poetic imagination such an important art for you? And of course, for the rest of us generally, and then maybe um, why Celtic poetry and folklore specifically, as you hinted up before with your ancestors? And... Hmm. Well, let's start by thinking about different types of time. Two types of time in the Mediterranean world, are, are what they call Kronos time and Kairos time. Kronos time is when you hear, Mark, please get in the car. You've <laughs> got to go to the supermarket, then you've got to drop the kids off and granny's waiting. That's, that's Kronos time. And it's <laughs> useful. But Kairos time is when, in a Blakeian sense, you experience pinpricks of the eternal. It's when you hear the Song of Wandering Angus by W.B. Yeats, uh, or you hear, there's an old Inuit poem, when words were like magic, when words spoke and they could suddenly become alive. And poetry alerts us that we are entering, again, what Moriarty calls divine ground. We're entering divine ground. And it's best to take your shoes off, I think, when you hear real poetry, because there's some burning bushes going on. Uh, so that's really what it does. And as we know, myth traffics and, and poetry traffics in metaphor and metaphor does something to the human soul. It's very popular at the moment in some of the circles I live in to be a bit snooty about metaphor. But we would be foolish to do that because actually poetry would fall apart if we didn't take metaphor seriously. And when you go through enormous difficult stuff in your life, you need an elevated language like poetry to describe the weight of what you're experiencing. I've just been reading and listening actually this week to the book of Job. That's not fun and games, that story, but the language is very, very good. And most of, I just don't want to read this anymore. This is horrendous. <laughs> uh, but actually the poetics in the book of Job are so good. It got, it got, got me through. Amazing. And um, another element, I think, in line with the, the Celtic uh, folklore and things like that you, you describe is the importance of oral tradition. I wonder if you might describe that and why that's so important to maintain in a kind of society that where that seems to have fallen by the wayside for the most part. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and first of all, I have to say um, that for me, really, there, there's nothing quite, I mean, Cel Celtic myth in general, Arthurian myth, but the Irish stuff, especially the west of Ireland, that Con Connemara area, uh, which is which is in my blood, I have to say. So when I tell those stories, you know, I'm beginning to touch in on a kind of dream, a, almost like a dream language. It's like an ancestral thing that's beginning to cook away. The oral tradition is a very interesting thing. Uh, myth, often, I've said this a million times, and many other people have, Myth doesn't have a distinctive author in the way that there's no like Charles Dickens of myth. Um, the myth really in its deeper sense, not mythic, because say Lord of the Rings is a mythic book, but it's not a myth. A myth, is a, these are PhD distinctions, but they're <laughs> very interesting. Uh, myth takes a long time to land. It needs, seems to pass through many mouths, many cultures, and over time, it gets polished like a stone in water to a point where it becomes a myth. Something that uh, one of my dear Irish friends, Tommy Tiernan actually, who's a good pal, Tommy says, you know, I, I need something I can hang my soul on. Uh, and myths are deep enough to hang your soul on, you know? Uh, but the oral tradition means 
that you don't get a moment that is frozen like a DVD of, you know, Gladiator. You can't freeze frame it. So I'll tell a story like uh, The Pursuit of Dermot and Gronje, um, and it's different. It's slightly different every time I tell it. And that means that you're dealing with a wild animal. You're dealing with a story that is alive. Um, I've been thinking recently that, you know, uh, one of my favorite things is the Gospel of Mark. Because there's a, you know, you know, you know the Gospel of Mark. You know there's that propulsion. He's like a little pugilist, and then, and then, we really need someone to tell the Gospel of Mark like that. Tommy Tiernan would be very good. Um, but of course, we also love the language of the Gospels, so we don't want it to deviate utterly. <laughs> Otherwise, that would be terribly confusing. But. Uh, but it's interesting. I mean, you think about you think about the Gospels, and one of the things that makes them so authentic for me is when the the details don't agree. You know, well, John says this, and, and Mark says that, and that slight bump, those lovely little wild edges, give it actually its authenticity. It's what makes you begin to wonder, maybe this actually happened, which is a very disturbing thought. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And um, something that I think is most important and interesting is how the scriptures then serve Kent as a foundation for our culture. And we see Shakespeare and all of these different wonderful works that have sprung from that and can only really arise within that kind of mil biblical milieu. Um, people talk about Dante. I know you spoke a bit about that with Mark Vernon, people like that. Uh, I wonder what are some of your favourite works then that have come from down from that Christian tradition uh, through the Middle Ages, Renaissance, any of those periods? Well, that's a that's a big a big thing, and, and I might have more to say about that in a few months' time because it's very much part of my life at the moment. The stories that I'm really interested in are actually the much neglected stories of you know the holy women, the wild saints, the people that go out in the bush. The story of of Patrick's bell that only rings when you're in the heart of Ireland. You know this lad goes out with Paddy's bell. And he says it will ring when when I want you to set up a you know when when the right place to set your you know your settlement is, and it doesn't settle in the it doesn't ring in a a meadow full of flowers it doesn't it doesn't ring in the villages it rings out in the wild wild dark forest filled with animals and this lad's first disciples its first scholars his first students are boars and foxes and badgers. That's the kind of thing I'm very attracted to because actually we're back to what I said at the beginning, which is myth when it's really working best speaks across species. And actually within the rather neglected mythologies of Christianity that expend out from scripture and the gospels, you get these incredible ecological messages. And there's hundreds of these stories. There's not just a few of them, there's hundreds. And I would imagine one of the big labors in my own life over the next few years, God willing, will be to not only transcribe them, but to tell them. And to tell them in the same way I would tell the birth of a sheen or the fire birth of Russian fairy tale. Uh, so those are the stories I'm really energized about. You know, I'm interested in a new but ancient liturgical relationship to the wildness in Christ's words. That's what we need. Come on. You know this. You know this, Mark. You love it. <laughs> you know, and there's something in the air at the moment. It's very exciting. I, honestly, if you had sat me and Paul down with a pint of Paul Kingsnorth, if you sat us down with a pint of porter four years ago and said, in four years' time, both of you will be God botherers <laughs> and fully, fully paid up Christians, we would have, I, I would have put a grand on the table that that wouldn't have been the reality. But that's what happens when something that is mightier than personal ambition announces itself. And if you've really been looking for a while, you, you're foolish to, you can't ignore that kind of stuff. Mm. 
And um, just on Paul, then, if we might say, I want to ask how you came to know one another and I suppose why you think he is such a significant figure today uh, for yourself and for many of, of, of he us. Is, he, Paul is a significant <laughs> figure. Uh, I met him 10 years ago. We met in a wonderful Cornish town called Lost Withiel. Lost Withiel. And it was a, it was a, I know it sounds like I'm making it up, but I wasn't. It was a, it was a dark and stormy night. And I was walking towards the pub and I saw a figure in the dark walking towards me. Didn't, and it was in the dark. And I just said, is it you? And he's loved that ever since. He always reminds me of the fact that I just said, is it, is it you? And we sat down and Paul was involved with something called the Dark Mountain Project. A very interesting sort of literary, eco-literary perspective on the times that we were living in. Very A very valid thing with uh, Dougal Hind and, and many others. Uh, and we became good friends. Paul went out, I remember he did a wilderness vigil with me, sat on the hill. He was much more of a seeker than I was. Uh, he was going out and sitting in Zen temples and got involved in Wicca and, and all of that kind of thing. Whereas I had long found really what it was that sustained me, which was deep myths and long sits in the bush. And, that's, I, and to this day, I mean, that's a wonderful, I, I recommend it. It's a very healthy thing to do. One of the problems with, uh, you know, one of the things with becoming a Christian, which I, I, I haven't become a Christian, I've just realized I am a Christian, <laughs> what the same, uh, is people always want you to then create this sort of terrifying narrative that you'd be dead or in jail and everything before was Luciferic and everything is good. Now it's not as god uses everything you know and uh i feel i felt in his presence for a very very long time i have to be honest but somehow for some reason he decided it was time to really put the heat on me about 18 months ago now coming back to paul the wonderful thing is is might have been a bit earlier but around that time Paul went through something very, very profound in his life. And I know he's written a long essay about it that you can read. And so to our astonishment, the two of us have ended up, uh, and Paul also, to give him credit, has been, you know, once he caught the, once he caught the air that his friend Martin may be getting pulled into, you know, into it, he's been a wonderful support and, you know, full of, full of love and encouragement. But the reason why I think Paul is especially significant is that he has a kind of very sobering overview on the nature of the times we're in he doesn't shy away from the dark stuff he's brave in that regard he he's quite happy to have plenty of enemies uh, but at the same time and more importantly than that his heart is being thoroughly demolished by christ and so if he goes into difficult areas, the the ground he's the ground that radiates through that I trust, because there's plenty of people with difficult news out there. But I think that one of the reasons that Paul is important is that combination of of heart and and steel. Mm -hmm. you know? I don't want to write I don't want to write endless articles about COVID, or transgender or any of that any of that stuff but he will do it and i and admire him for it mm, yeah me too thanks martin and then um if i may shift to yourself just briefly well not necessarily briefly but to um ask about how this yeshua this strange character has revealed himself to you more recently as you describe and um why what's the significance i suppose behind that kind of aramaic name and as opposed to even to the more familiar Jesus that many of us are familiar with? I think the problem is the word you just used, familiar. Yeah. We we're familiar. We think we're familiar with fat, blonde, gun-toting American Jesus. <laughs> and he's not this thin-skinned, strange, kind of slightly, slightly frightening character. And I thought that just using his name, his real name, Yeshua, would, would do something to my imagination. It would help me re-behold him and not fall into old patterns. So that was, that was what that was about. I thought, no, we think we know what Jesus is, but Jesus, 
and the Christ that Jesus is part of is far bigger than that name. So let's rehydrate it by just calling him Yeshua for a bit. It might, it might change, but it's a good first move. Mm -hmm. I, I got into this trouble for a, from a variety of angles. Predominantly, I went out on a very long vigil for 101 days. Now, just to state, that didn't mean I was in the woods all day long. I was visiting a wood for several hours a day for 101 days. And at the end of it, I stayed up all night uh, in a night vigil in the middle of this deep, deep forest. And I had, I had an absolutely extraordinary experience, Mark. And I, you know, I'm of an age now where I just have to, you just have to boldly state these things. Now, first of all, what I'm going to tell you is not dreamlike, visionary. I wasn't in any kind of altered state. I just had a cup of tea at the cottage. I'd eaten. I was fine. I was just relieved that this vigil was about to bloody finish. <laughs> and I'm in the wood. It's about one o'clock in the morning. It's minus five, minus six. It's cold. So I'm hopping from foot to foot. I'm going to be out there all night. And... I found myself looking up in the air, which usually I'm, I'm looking at into the darkness, seeing if there's stags or foxes. And I look up because I'm saying, you know, give me a vision for my life, show me what to do. And it suddenly what looked, the, it, the colors were like the Aurora Borealis. And it was just like this kind of arrow of, of all these colors, just sort of, I saw it getting bigger and bigger in the sky and then it fell into the ground silently about 10 foot to my right, just like shoo, completely silent. It's one thing for something like that to happen. I have no difficulty with someone saying that's natural phenomena completely, but the difference is the context. The difference is when it happens on sacred ground, when you're in the, when you were at the climax of a 101 day vigil where you're trying to find out how to live your deepest life out of the frigging sky like something out of the old testament falls this kind of beautiful hour of light i got through the night i got back to my cottage got into bed and just as i did i saw this very strange succession of words just as i closed my eyes they were in gold um inhabit the time and genesis of your original home that's odd inhabit the time and genesis of your original home and even as I fell asleep the bit of it that I didn't like was the mention of the word genesis because I have an association with the word genesis which is like oh no 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 don't please any no 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 anything 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 but Christianity uh fell asleep and then for about 18 months wrestled wrestled with it but I started to have dreams. Uh, I started to meet more and more people that turned out to be Christians. Uh, I also did an anthology of the work of someone I've only already mentioned, John Moriarty, the Irish philosopher, did it for Lilliput Press. And John didn't have digital files for a lot of his books, so I had to type them up. So you're typing up this Catholic philosopher for hours and hours and hours a day. That's going to have an effect. That's going to have an effect. So it was coming at me from all of these angles. And actually, it was last October, just before my 50th birthday, in the middle of an interview, rather like this one, a guy asked me a question, and I realized what had happened. He said, he just said something like, so Martin, has anything interesting happened in your life recently? <laughs> he expected me to promote a new book. Uh, and suddenly I was like, well, actually, here we go. And I rung, I rung my mum and dad afterwards and I said, you know, you know, you have three children, two of them are Christians. Now you have three Christians. Now that might not mean a lot to other people, but I promise you in, in my family's world, that's a big, that's big news. That's big news. And it's led to a, we've always had a wonderful relationship, but it's been particularly interesting over these last eight months. They're great companions, my family. Mm, glory to God. And um, it's hard to <laughs> follow that, I must be honest, Martin. But um, 
One thing I did want to ask you about was, in line, I think, with what you mentioned previously, you don't have this kind of stark contrast between my degenerate life beforehand and my regeneration in Christ or anything like that. But um, I'm wondering what is one distinct about this kind of mossy face of Christ that you've described? And then two, how does that maybe um, fulfill the work that you're already doing, if I might put it that way? Or I don't want to put words in your mouth. but Yeah. I, I, I've said this a couple of times, but um, myth, myths from around the world tell us an awful lot about the deep experiences of life. And they are filled. I would have to say, I, I'll take a, I'll take a punt now, and forgive me because some of the people watching this won't like what I'm about to say. But Christ-like qualities, Christ-like qualities, are infused through many myths and stories, but Christ isn't. What happens between AD and AD 33, which is a historical event is different. It's as if everything that myths had promised from the Mediterranean up into the Celtic world, way out into the Aboriginal territories, find themselves in a time and space that we can comprehend, but rather than a figure that is ambitious, narcissistic, and, you know, a sort of Zeusian figure, Christ turns all of that on he, absolutely on its head. And when I read, as my heart started to, to soften, and I started to read the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, which is not a common mythical perspective on how to live. That's not Beowulf. That's not Beowulf talking to you. That's not Odysseus talking to you. That's not Zeus talking to you. It's not Cucullin the Hound of Ulster talking to you. The trouble with Jesus, and it's the reason I kept away from him, is the benchmark is very, very high. It's one thing to go out and, you know, be a warrior. All of that stuff is terrific. But, but Yeshua just keeps turning things on its head. And, you know, again, it's that phrase that I love, let down your nets, drop your nets. You, you know, the, the mandate is high. I was talking to... I have a sort of fledgling relationship with a spiritual father now, uh, an, an orthodox teacher. And we were talking about Christianity the other day, and I don't think he'll mind me saying this. He said, look, you know, I was really pushing certain issues. And he said, look, you know, you, you've, you've been rescued from the dung heap and you are now dining with princes. And that means that you have to take on what they call noblesse oblige. In other words, if you are noble, act noble. So to be honest with you, this encounter with Christianity is like a rediscovery of the chivalric code. It's like a way of being in the world. And the question I'm asking everybody at the moment is how do we make church more like Camelot? We need more vocation. This is devastatingly deep news. The, the Yeshua event, even though it's 2000 years ago, part of the miracle is that it can still have the, the mind boggling effect on people this far down the line. Uh, so noblesse oblige, you know, it's, it's if, you know, that's what I think Christ puts on the table. And so interestingly, I was curious about what would happen to all the myths I've been telling for years. Would they fall apart in my mouth? But they wouldn't. They don't because they have so much. They have so much of Christ in them. They have so many pinpricks in them. But for me, the accomplishment of Christianity, not necessarily the church over the last 2000 years, but the accomplishment of Christ is it takes all of that potential bursts into time and space and leaves us with this story of stories excellent thank you martin and um something you mentioned there that i thought is interesting jonathan pajot who i've spoken with several times on floor orthodox icon carver and paul spoke with he describes even how christ stretches out the stories from the highest to the lowest and it's, it's 
it's expanding our minds to have to think in those terms kind of fills up the hierarchy is a wonderful way of describing it i think uh, between the two of you it might actually help people to understand understand the radical claims of the of christ and the, the radicality of his character <laughs> which i think a lot of people misunderstand unfortunately every, every every parable of christ is like a stained glass window everyone is like a stained glass window an immensity immense true reality true imagination is just radiating through these stories but they're hard and they're clean and they're very angular and they're really mysterious you know i it, it, and we're I, I i'm sure i know paul would be in accord with me and i'm sure jonathan too and many many others that are starting to emerge we need the weird again like don't domesticate christ have we so chloroformed our soul have we so anesthetized the wildness of the message that a lot of the time what we're getting sold as christianity is in is an insipid facsimile or a photocopy it's not the real you know we all know we all know the difference between this glass of water and what lagavulin or lafroig tastes like a good whiskey uh yeah so it's just just thoughts that i'm i'm having you know and i i just put my hand up you know i'm i'm only a learner driver in all of this you know i'm i'm still got the learner plates any theologian could take me apart in a second but sometimes and i think this is the case with paul and others as well when you're new to something you are, there's often a bit of beginner's luck with new christians there's often a bit of beginner's luck it will wear out <laughs> but you often have it for a moment so while there's a, a door to one or two interesting ideas it's it's best to get them out you know <laughs> brilliant thanks Martin. and um something i find interesting now looking back in the light of what we're speaking about is reading your works kind of like we do with the old testament through the, the light of the new so i'd love to look at some of the themes of uh, your books and actually see how we might come to wrestle with them now maybe even from a distinctly christian perspective so for example a branch from the lightning tree which we referenced before ecstatic myth and the grace of wilderness i want to take a little quote from that if i may so the breakdown of initiation and the diminishment of mythic understanding are actually defenses against encountering our own beauty I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, the, um, the importance of things like initiation, again, which we've sort of unfortunately lost in our modern culture, and of course, beauty, which you remind us of. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, be beauty makes us fall in love with the world again. It affects our conscious, con it affects our conscience because beauty then shows us what we want to defend, what we what we love. So that line in it, and I remember in I remember writing that and thinking, oh, this is important. We are many of us are defended against an encounter of our beauty. Now, when I say beauty, I don't mean the kind of stuff you see on Instagram or it's nothing you can buy. It's actually what in Irish myth, Dermot son of Divney, Dermot son of Divney, who's right hand man for a long time of the great Finn McCall, he has a mark on his face and it's called a love spot. And most of the time, Dermot keeps it hidden, so you don't know, you don't see his love spot. Because if you do, you fall incorrigibly and forever in love with him. And everyone has a love spot, but most of us have fallen asleep to that reality. And so, myth, by its very amplification, by its the vivacity, the hugeness of the mythic stories, it gets us emotional, it gets our heart beating, it reminds us of what of what we love. So the themes of the themes of sacrifice, the themes of service, always in my stories, quite organically, I didn't do it consciously, of being in service to something that is greater than yourself, um, of journeying to the other world or the underworld, which is of course what is Christ Christ's up to between Easter Friday and his you know reemergence. He's down there in the underworld. That would be, I'm sure someone's written it already, but someone needs to write a book called Christ in the Underworld. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. <laughs> I'm going to write that down right now. I um, think in the underworld. I think a Hans Urs von Balthasar actually wrote a book about that, you know. Yeah. yeah, I'll look for it. I'll look for it. Um, 
So the themes really going back, as, I, as I've said, uh, I've had a lot of Christian readers over the years and um, they always said to me, you know, you're, you're a Christian, you just don't know you're a Christian. Uh, and, the, and that's what's happened is I've just realized I'm just a not very good Christian. <laughs> I'm like a pirate Christian who's really working on it. You know, <laughs> I've been in love with the sea and the moon and women really. Uh, and, and that was always build, that was building to an even bigger love, you know, that I just didn't know I was about to encounter. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, recently, you have spoken or written, I remember, about attending the Divine Liturgy, which I thought was powerful. I wonder if you'd describe that and maybe the importance of sacraments or all this are also called mysteries in initiation. Have you thought about that much in, in light of that? And especially, again, in a culture of prolonged adolescence, it seems we don't have, have these maturing initiations. No, no the, the, the divine liturgy is one of the really extraordinary experiences uh, of, my, of my adult life, and I'm very new to it. But I know, I, do know, when, I know when God's in the house uh, and I get very, very quiet. Uh, and that's what happened. I was in a shopping mall in Exeter where they built a mall around this tiny little Anglo-Saxon church that they, they can't knock it down, though they'd love to, to put up something that sells porn and fizzy drinks. They have to keep this Anglo-Saxon church up. And I entered into the liturgy, you know, lasts about an hour and a half, you stand up the whole time. Um, an entirely different proposition. The only bit that's regarded as slightly less than holy is the sermon. <laughs> that's when you can sit down. Now, isn't that interesting? Because I like sermons. And, and growing up in a Baptist church, one of the things that Baptists are really good at sermons, you know, you get real bang for your buck. People are, tend to be very dismissive uh, about other denominations. It's one of the things I found quite unsettling about moving into Christianity is as soon as I did it, everybody's kind of, if you're not careful, they snipe at each other. We're brothers and sisters, you know, let love rule. <laughs> Uh, I, I really, I wrote this down recently, I've been saying it, you know, with everything that's happening in the world at the moment, I'd I think all, all churches and all denominations should take a year out and worship in a tent, worship outside, listen to their dreams, and each, each parish in Ireland should choose an animal to have as a teacher alongside the bishop or the pastor and see what happens with that animal as a teacher. I'm not saying worship it. I'm just saying talk to it. So that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, amazing. Um, that was something I was going to ask you about. And kind of, I'm a big reader of Wendell Berry, and I think he gets across that healthy balance between agriculture and culture. I sort of wanted to ask you a little bit about that. And, What's this, the kind of organic nature of the relationship between the land, the local folklore, agriculture, culture, how it all fits together? And I suppose in, based around what you just said and more, how might we help to play a part in restoring that in an organic manner rather than kind of top down or simpli what do you say, simplistic ways? You, you will know that the word culture comes from colère, which means to dig. So to understand culture, you've got to dig. And uh, I, th if there's one book, if I may be so hubristic, to recommend of mine in this regard, it's called Scatterlings, Getting Claimed in the Age of Amnesia, Getting Claimed in the Age of Amnesia, where I drew a kind of chalk circle of about 20 miles around from where I live. And for five years, just studied the deep mythologies of place, the folk tales of place. You get myths that navigate all over the world, which are wonderful and universal, but then you get myths that are really site specific. And if you're interested in stories that root you to a place in particular, to be what I call of a place, not just from a place, to be of a place, not just from a place. Because I have friends that were Jain monks in India, but they have as close a relationship to Dartmoor now where I live as I do. You know, it's not just about the bones of your dead. Even now, an ancestor can come out or something can grab you. 
So the thing to do is limit your vision. These days, part of the, the great enspellment of modernity is we are paralyzed by choice. There's a tyranny of choice, actually. And so we end up with thin, negligible knowledge about lots of things and no wisdom. We have knowledge, but we don't have wisdom. You begin to get wisdom when you say, you know what, like one of those old horses where you put the, you know, you go, I'm, I'm not going to engage in the whole tapas of modern spirituality for a moment. I'm going to really look down and say, I'm just using an example, my little, my, my brothers and sisters at this church of St. Pancras in Rome in Exeter, these eight people, well, nine people, it's tiny, doing the divine liturgy. When that is happening, that is the church. That is the Aboriginal church. I am right in the center. This is, this is the navel of the world. This is the Axis Mundi, you know, and this is all I need to concentrate on right now. There was a thing that exploded in the late 20th century called comparative mythology, where every, and, and this was led by a very bright man, Joseph Campbell, but we're not as bright as Campbell. So it becomes habitual for people to go, oh, well, of course, Baba Yaga is actually Kali from India. She's the same. Everything's the same. And Pan is actually called so-and-so over here in Kanonis, of course. It's a, that's a huge insult to a lot of deities. Let them be. Because actually what you find all over the world are these, you know, little Elohims, these little gods of rivers and, and mountains who would be terribly offended if you said, oh, you're, you're just a version of what lives 200 miles away in Egypt. They wouldn't like that. You know, uh, you know, whatever my relationship to myth, it's it's respectful because it's it for me, it's alive. Mm -hmm. Amazing, thanks, Martin. And um, you also mentioned the importance, uh, even from your own experience, of places like specific places like Snowdonia. I want to ask you about that, and even um, about why mountains in particular are so important symbolically. It seems to be the world over, as you say, one of those universal patterns. Yes. I have to be careful because one of the one of the things I get criticized for is my attention on leaving domestic settings and going out into mountainous regions and people mishear that and they think that I am implying a kind of you know survival course where you learn to whittle and do bushcraft i like those things actually but that's not what it is far more women have worked with me over the last 25 years than men funnily enough but so in other words of course spiritual information can arrive by the hearth fire of course it lives within families of course it lives within intimate relationships but if you're not careful the sheer maintenance of raising children and the rest of it can domesticate your contact with this electrical wheel <laughs> of energy that's called the Trinity. Uh, so it's a good thing to go out into onto mountains, to hills, to be by rivers. I mean, what do you, what was, why, you know, one of the things we know Yeshua probably didn't have was a bedroom. You know, he's just a right people want, you know, you know what I mean? People are on him day and night. And so he takes himself off, doesn't he, early in the morning. And he goes out to sit in the bush and he goes out to places where some would be frightened to go, you know, goes frightened to go. But he, he listens. And unless I've got this wrong, if you really are going to be noblesse oblige, if you're going to be a Christian, you are, an, you are now an icon of Christ you know, is what you're aspiring to. And so why don't we, why don't we, why don't you greet the dawn every day for a year? You know, why, why, you know, why don't you find some way of letting into your daily pattern some wild, you know, strange, gnarly bit of information? You know, we have the gospels that we have in our hands, but we have the gospels and many Christian writers have said this before, we have the gospel of the cormorant, we have the gospel of Ben Bulbin, we have the gospel of the Burren, we have the gospel of, uh, you know, Skellig Michael, uh, you know, again, to <laughs> quote many other people, every single animal we hold is a book of God. You know, it's, it, I think that's the thing that, that is a little fledgling Christian 
the one thing that's happened is that I'm seeing, I see Christ everywhere. I don't really, I encounter it in the Bible, but it spills out over the pages into all sorts of conversations. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not vindictive, you know, irritable and tired, but, but the thing that really works, people say, you know, this world is so depressing. How do I survive it? The problem really, or the issue is to move from seeing circumstance to beholding it. And that's what John Moriarty was so brilliant at is when you go from the John Moriarty could take whatever, whatever, the next three hours of your life, Mark, will look like after we have this conversation. Whatever it is, Moriarty would detect the luminous in it. And he'd be able to tell it in a compelling way that deepened, you know, again, to use his phrase, the divine ground of that story in your story. And by doing that, it energizes you, your heart is tenderized, and it's a world filled with disclosure again. Uh, and, and, you know, it then to that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks, Martin. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation alongside yourself and Paul and many others in November. Just um, before we go this evening, then, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about or um, share some of those passions that you're describing previously? No, I think I've, prob I've probably said more than enough. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to bore people. But um, just, just it's it's an exciting time. I hope you find your way to Bembo. We, I know we've got a few tickets left, um, and yeah, more soon. Brilliant. And um, where can viewers or listeners find out more about you and your work, then, Martin? Well. Uh, probably the easiest thing to do is just to Google Dr. Martin Shaw and that'll take you to a variety of websites. The really important website actually has where you can buy my books. There's a small, there's a small bunch on Amazon, but there's a far more. I've managed to get, I actually managed to get the copyright back on my first three books, which is always, I always respect my old publishers for doing that for me. Uh, Sister Mystica. You'll see it under my name, Sister Mystica. That's C-I-S-T-A-M-Y-S-T-I-C-A, -S -S Sister Mystica. That'll take you to books and lots of audio recordings as well. So, uh, you know, hours of me yakking away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martin, and God bless you. No!